1587, Sir Francis Drake did something that probably had more to do with provoking the Armada than the traditional historical view. Okay, what did I say last time was one of the things that provoked the Armada? Yeah. Uh, the, the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots. Why would that do that? Because Philip the second of Spain considered her the legitimate monarch because the Catholic Church considered her the legitimate monarch. And, you know, whether he's sincere in this or not, he's looking for an excuse. Uh, but in 
but bring it in. Capture it, bring it in, refit it for your own purposes. These ships are expensive. And so you don't want to lose them. I mean, going out to Port of Spell and sinking the enemy ship is not an, it's not an ideal situation. So in the, in the Ottoman battle, uh, the Battle of Lepanto, back in 1671, this was a And the Ottomans decided to rebuild their entire navy. And they deforested about a third of Europe to do it. Uh, these are big ships. These are heavy ships. Uh, and But it's a different, the warfare is changing. What changed the warfare is actually is what we call the Atlantic experience. Ships sailing from England, from France, from the Dutch Netherlands, from going down from Spain and Portugal, even especially the Portuguese, in the Atlantic trade are going to learn a whole new kind of sailing. Remember, nobody had been in the Atlantic. The Atlantic may be right in front of you, it may be on your front door, but nobody sailed until you get to the early 1400s. Nobody went out there. Everybody was still messing with the Mediterranean. They had very different conditions and a very different mindset. So uh, this attack at Cadiz by Sir Francis Drake makes him a su he's a superhero. Well, he's already done damage. What was the other damage he did? Let me see if anybody else has studied this guy. Anybody? Anybody? Yes? He attacked them in Panama. In Panama. What happened in Panama? Anybody? He was named for the Spanish treasure uh, from the Pacific and off of that was a huge, uh, that was a huge, <coughs> that was a big investment. Uh, who, how, I mean, you got this Manila galleon that's coming all the way from the Philippines, loaded with a year's supply of material <coughs> the Asian trade, the Japan trade, the China trade, these are the Portuguese trading with the Spanish at the middle. The Spanish had never had a the provincial <coughs> trade at Japan or China. They never did. They were got. The Portuguese were allowed there by the Treaty of Tordesillas back in 1499. So the Spanish never said, but they, they do have the Philippines, and they use the Philippines as a, an interpost, a depot for trade in the far, west, far uh, west Pacific. And then all that trade comes to Manila in the way of silks, uh, porcelain products, hardwood, teakwood, mother of pearl, all kinds of stuff. Uh, that actually was totally rare, including the first importation of tea, which nobody ever had before. So that's coming, and that's coming across in the Manila Galleon. Uh, comes across to uh, sometimes right into Panama, sometimes it sails to Acapulco, and then it was transported across Mexico and sailed from Veracruz, Mexico, across to uh, Seville, Spain. The other route is the one using. That's used when you have uh, all of that trade coming up from uh, you know, after the conquest of the, of the Inca Empire. Uh, the Spanish are bringing treasure ships up, loaded with, with silver bullion, uh, up to Panama, and then transloading onto the, across the, the business, uh, and then bringing it across, and then have ships leaving them there uh, to take it across to Seville. So this was a, I mean, these ships were loaded with stuff. This is a once in a year, once a year deal. And Sir Francis Drake is waiting for it for the remainder of the year. I didn't say look it up. Oh, remember it. It was in 1571. Sound right? Yes. Okay. So this is all happening at the same time. Battle of Lepanto, 1571, capturing of the trade across. So Sir Francis Drake has this, you know, he's daring, he's got this great reputation, daring do all of this, all of this. Uh, and he's a hero to the English. So now we're talking, uh, in 87, he attacks Cadiz. Just because he could do it, if, he's, if he tried, are the Spanish being drawn? 
draw it into something? Are they indeed provoked into something? I think that's a good question. Is Elizabeth the Lutheran provoking the Spanish into an attack by the action that she did? There are two countries that have, by this time, no love for each other. What is Philip II's potential gripe with England? Just think about it. What's his history with England? Does he have a history with England? Give us a thought. Shows up as a question. Give us a thought. Okay. He was uh, married to the to Queen Mary yeah. before she died, right. and then. And he was quote unquote called the king, king of king of England. Uh, in a sense, I don't think he ever shows up on the on the roll sheets of Westminster. But he's definitely, but he but he had a claim. And of course, as soon as she dies, that claim is null and void. He's he's out of the picture. He's out of the running. Uh, and so he's considered to be kind of, and he was that product of two sons of Henry Todd or whatever. Uh, and her treatment of Mary Queen of Scots. And Dutch rebel against Philip II. Philip II made a big tactical blunder by acquiring Portugal in 1580. He's acquired all of Portugal's colonies. And now, now that now makes Portugal and all her overseas colonies a target of Dutch opportunity. The Dutch merchant fleet, called the VOC, are also known as what? The Dutch. The Dutch East India. Dutch East India Company, big one. Probably the biggest at the time. Private investment company uh, put together by some seven cities in Holland, each with a board of directors, each one building this, what's called an empire within the empire. Uh, the Dutch East India Company becomes a company Is there a king? No. no. What do you have? Stapholder. The state holder, stapholder. Okay. House of Orange. It's it's a dynasty, there's no question. But it, it sort of goes by a different name. Uh, the Dutch give the Spanish a lot of grief, and so Philip II is now dreamed up as the major king of England. Uh, to finally knock out Elizabeth. Now, what are what are the major problems with the English war? Protestants. sailing all over the globe, trying to absorb big Portuguese colonies. They didn't want to bother with Spanish colonies. Why, do they, why not? Because the Spanish colonies, Spain has what? Mexico and Brazil. That's for them. They're going to spend that. They've got the manpower to do it. And they, and they just thought that they're, they're, they're going to be, they're going to be, that's suicide. You don't want to attack, go after Mexico. Not go after Peru. You're not going to 
you're not going to do that. But you can go after the Portuguese colonies in Guatemala. And the entire Portuguese overseas empire, all they had was you know, at its height 10,000 people running the Portuguese overseas empire. It's an amazing phenomenon. It's, there's a book on it by Harold Rocker called the OSCR, the Portuguese Overseas Empire. It is phenomenal. It's old, it's dated, it's out of print. Get a copy. some of the most talented people in Spain, some of the most cultured in Spain, and now a whole new element of Protestants that, that confessed to the, to the Protestant cause living in Spain, who were involved in merchant business and so forth, they are all now forced to leave the country. Jews, Muslims, Protestants, after, after 15, 20, 15, 30, Protestants are part of the deal, part of the eviction. do it because their armies and their navies were occupied trying to defeat the Ottomans. And who was, who was going to be throwing armies and navies at them? Suleiman. He's doing it deliberately. He's not a Protestant for crying out loud, but he's doing it because it is throwing it, it is throwing the Habsburg Catholics and breaking them off balance. In the middle of this, we can 
decided to launch a major invasion and attack the city of Vienna, capital of the Habsburg Empire. So this is this is the geopolitical struggle that never shows up in the books on Western history. But the Ottomans are really prominent in saving the Protestant economy. Without this, it's unlikely that Martin Luther would have ever gotten his you know, his little other boots off the ground. That he would have ever been saved for the, for, you know, for, for the Protestant cause. That John Calvin would have ever gotten away with writing his Christian Institutes, dedicating to <coughs> Francis I of France and really being hell about it. Francis I is a Catholic king, so the last thing he wants is Calvin to think that he's dedicated to it. So these guys are really outlandish. So this is the empire that shows up on, in the east, and it's big. And looking at this, uh, if we can provoke the Spanish world to provoke the world of Philip II, the Senate of Charles V, provoke them into a fight, while their back is turned, maybe the Ottomans could really deal a death blow to them. Why? Because England is looking to enforce something that they can't do entirely on their own. To enforce a new doctrine that's been evolved just in the decade, the decade earlier. What, dec what, what, what doctrine is that? Say what? Well, it's, a, it's, gonna, it's gonna involve balance of power, but it's something else. Yeah? He lives with uh, people in uh, compromise to oh. protect her subject. You don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. If you can't protect them, they're not yours. What are we talking about? Overseas colonies, especially in, in the Western Hemisphere. That means your claim to the big to the gold digging and silver mining in Mexico is that well, you know, that's pretty well protected. But nonetheless, you can't claim Canada. We, well, we have a, we have we can challenge this. First of all, we don't find Adrian the Fourth's view of the world, dividing the world in 1499 between Portuguese and Spanish. We don't think that. That's a total Catholic call, and now we got the Protestant Reformation going. We don't acknowledge that. It's a new, it's a brave new world. It's effective occupation, written by Richard. Is the challenge to Spain. It's the one that really bids, it digs in the most and causes the most aggravation to the Spanish world. You may have a little fort there in St. Augustine, Florida, the earliest city ever put up there by European Americans, by Europeans and Americans, Americans in North America. But we don't recognize it as claiming all of Florida or much of anything else. You can claim all you want. We're going to move in. And we're going to develop ways to do this. And in the reign of Elizabeth, she does develop ways of doing this. You're going to find that all these so-called powers that are influenced by Calvinism have a certain kind of way of doing this. And most, most effectively is what? The use of companies. The Virginia Company was one of not the earliest, but the second earliest company to be developed. And it's developed by Sir Walter Raleigh, and he uses that to plant a colony off the coast of Virginia at Roanoke, Roanoke Island, in the late 1500s. It's a colony that disappeared from history, uh, but later that claim was re again readjusted. So the landing in Jamestown, Virginia, in 15 in 167. Uh, is still under the Virginia Company auspices. What is the Virginia Company? It's named after Queen Elizabeth, the Persian Queen, so we got the Virginia Company. And then the next big company to operate is going to be the uh, East India Company. 
established uh, about just about the time of Elizabeth, just before Elizabeth died, 1600, she'll die in 1603. They're using these combinators, which is the Calvinist way of putting together a Bergen, Spankers, and so forth for expansion. do this, the English do this, with the Spanish everything is done, and the Portuguese everything is done by the crown, there are no private accounts. So you can tell the difference between Protestants and Catholics just in terms of the use of companies to burgeon the crown to involve the Spanish, the terms that are used. Well, <coughs> now we look at Charles II's response to all this, which is enough is enough is enough. So he's really a total of close to 100,000 troops. Who's going to handle the military aspect of the operation? The infantry. Uh, the Duke of Parma, P-A-R-M-A. -A. He's bringing troops from, uh, from the Netherlands, from the Low Countries, as well as a huge amount of army coming up from, from Italy. So here, this is called the Spanish March. Italy, to the Low Countries, you put into the whole Roman Empire, and the Low Countries, this is all controlled by Philip II. So here, then, uh, the Duke of Parma with 100,000 troops, but before that, Philip also has the grand, the grand plan. Now, let's see if some of the oversight you know what the grand plan is. Grand plan to take care of the bottom of the bar once and for all, for good luck, and again. The big division. Protestants are Calvinists. Why they wax to believe Calvinists? <coughs> Can't trust them. Uh, Calvinists are bad news. They represent everything the Catholic Church does not. They're a threat to the French king. He tries to wipe them out. This is going to take care of it. The last big attempt by the French <coughs> to wipe out the Calvinists and on the coast of France, the Huguenots, was uh, what? St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in, okay, 1577, okay. <coughs> He's done this, he's tried to do that. It's not successful, they're still there. So the religious wars are still going full steam. Next comes Louis from that, and his uh, William set moving over to then attack the Dutch Calvinists, <coughs> provided they can find a location to attack. That's the problem with the, the low countries. <coughs> well, it's one, two, and it's a knockout blow. Once you do that, you load all of your 100,000 troops off the Netherlands onto these barges and you sail across the English Channel like just like that. And you head to the, the Thames Estuary. You go up that, you unload your troops, you have your formation press of formation, supporting these troops, you land these troops, provided there's no opposition and the wind blows correctly and so forth, and Queen Elizabeth doesn't arrive on the spot to give a speech, all those things. And you, you win the war. It's, it is the, it's the Catholic cause. He's taken a little problem developed. First thing is the commander that he has appointed dies a week before the Amartya sails. <coughs> so who does he appoint? The Duke of Sidonia, S-I-D-O-N-I-A, 
The name is S-U-M-E-I-N-A. Uh, a very well-known general. He's never sailed the ship. He is now the admiral of the Armada. This is not a good sign. No. This is kind of strange. Yes. Did the Duke of Parma die a week before he moved? No, this is not Parma. Parma is the commander of the military, the infantry. It's proceeding up Italy, proceeding up out from Spain, and up through the Netherlands with a 100,000 man army. That's Parma. Um, and then as far as Parma's army is concerned on Dutch soil, what did the Dutch do? Kill them all. They tried. Came, uh, what could kill, kill you about half? What's that? Blood the dice. Yeah. The little Dutch, Dutch boy took his thumb out of the dice. <coughs> I mean, the Spanish, this has happened to them before. They haven't quite learned that Holland is like below sea level, and the dice are there for a reason. If you're there for the wrong reasons, that could, you know, Make it, make it a very bad weekend for her. So he does that. They, they lose a lot of their army in, in, in Holland. Uh, the attacks on France are very ineffective. So what the hell, let's just put everybody on board and sail across and go for England. And so it's too, the plan is too damn involved. It's too multifaceted. It requires uh, split second timing and some things. It requires the right uh, conditions for navigation, the right, the right weather, and everything that could go wrong went wrong. So on July the 23rd, the Armada finally arrives off the English coast. The lead I'd say the lead opposition coming after the Duke of uh, Sidonia Medina is Sir Francis Drake. Drake's a hero. And then Elizabeth shows up in Tilbury, T-I-L-B-U-R-Y, in <coughs> this speech. I had to find this thing. And uh, I can just imagine what, what the response was. We talked about it a little bit the other day, but I'll just give it to you again. Uh, she's up there with, on her horse with sword in hand, like she's going to battle herself. Okay? It's great image making. The Virgin Queen has replaced and has given the nation a national virgin to worship and to lead the nation, as opposed to the loss of the Virgin Mary. England is now a Protestant the Catholics have lost the Virgin Mary. And so the question is, what, is that, what, is, what does she represent? She represents, she is a substitute. At least the historians have suggested this. I, I, I really don't know just how that played at the time. I don't really know. But the symbolism is very heavy, and she gives a speech, and I don't know who recorded the speech. But it's quoted as if she, she gave this thing, and it seems to make sense. My loving people, we have been persuaded by some that we are careful that we are careful of our safety, to take heed now, we commit ourselves to, to arm multitudes for fear of treachery. But I do assure you, I do not desire to live to distrust my faithful and loving people. Her faithful and loving people, I love that. And she's just tied everybody to herself, okay? She's the Virgin Queen, she is the national hero, she's the symbol of the nation. Let tyrants fear. I have always so behaved myself that under God I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and goodwill of my subjects. Great stuff. And have always so behaved myself. Therefore I have come amongst you. As you see at this time, not for my recreation and disport, but being resolved in the midst and heat of battle to live or die amongst you all. I'm one of you. I'm here with you. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not in Hampton Palace. I'm here within view of the channel and the ships and what's going to happen. I'm here to suffer whatever you suffer, basically. 
live amongst you all, to lay down for my God, for my kingdom, and for my people, my honor, and my blood, even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman. <coughs> but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England, too. Now, this, this, this is a great ship. Pardon me, I love it. This is great. I mean, it's just, you know, you play with the words of, of, of material, and you, you wonder where the, you know, the Elizabethan language comes from, why it's so powerful. It's just, it, it's just great stuff. That's why, despite all the all the all the mistranslations and bad things that show up in terms of the King James version of the Bible, it's still the most popular Bible among in the Protestant world. They have written tons of modern translations. They love the old stuff. They love that's the Elizabethan. Mm -hmm. My loving people. I have always so conducted myself that under God my strength and safety lies in the loyal hearts and goodwill of my subjects. So I come amongst you, so at, this amongst time, you at this time, not for, my not for my recreation, but being resolved in the midst and heat of battle to live or die amongst you all, to lay down for my God and for my kingdom and my people, my honor and my blood even in the dust. I know. I have the body of a weak and feeble woman. But I have the heart and stomach of a king. And a king of England, too. And I think foul scorn that Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm. To which, rather than face that dishonor, I will myself take up arms beside you. I will be your general and your rewarder for your virtues in the field. We know that you already deserve rewards and crowns. And we do assure you, in the word of a prince, they shall be paid to you. And take heed too of my lieutenant general. For no prince ever commanded a more worthy or noble subject as he. By your obedience to him, by your valor in battle, we shall yet win a famous victory over these enemies of God, on my kingdom, and on my people! try to sail with some barges heading for the Thames River, and that's when uh, Sir Francis Drake attacked. They were going to head eventually toward Plymouth, but instead uh, they begin to head north, 
the storm is blowing them north, and then later after the whole thing is over, there's a comment that our God has scattered the, the enemy fleet with the, with the breath of his mouth, saying that God is a Protestant. Okay? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of this back and forth stuff. Uh, you believe what you want, but at the time you believe what's what's happening, and you think, and this is these are desperate times. England could possibly have been conquered. I doubt it. But you'd have a very large army. The English didn't have not have an army, and they liked this large, hundred thousand. Uh, and later in later years, they're going to celebrate the, this event twice <coughs> during the Napoleonic Wars after the sinking of Napoleon's great flagship. You know. Uh, after the uh, sinking of the, of the, uh, off, uh, the, battle, the Battle of Trafalgar by Nelson, since over half of that Franco-Spanish fleet, Napoleon's fleet, and then again in World War II, Operation Sea Lion, the Hitler is going to attack the, the English coast, and he can't do it because the British Navy is there waiting for him. So this all plays into this, this theme of growth of English power and the sea power. You and I were talking about the empire and all that stuff. I found a good book. Actually, I didn't find it. Public sent it to me. Uh, it's a, a map of the British Empire. It's about 300 pages. Boy, it's about 120 pages. It shows the various maps of the empire. I didn't know they were still. So it's, it's uh, something I really like. Instead of the empire. Now, this loss, now the wind hits, it blows the Spanish off course. They can't grapple the English ships. They're losing the cause. They sail around, and as I said before, they went all the way around Scotland. But I forgot to mention, they also sail around the Irish coast. You don't sail down between Scotland and Ireland. That's just too treacherous, but you go around the Irish coast. And some of these guys try to land on the Irish coast because why? We're Catholics, you're Catholics, yeah. you don't like the English, we don't like the English, but they saw them as another invader. Yeah. Because you don't speak a freaking word of anything that we understand. You're speaking Spanish, we don't speak Spanish here. Okay. Uh, we speak Gaelic, we may speak a little English, but Spanish never, and you know, we, who are you? Uh, and so they killed a bunch of guys around the coast of Ireland. About one half the ships actually made it back to Spain. And it's the end of the Armada. And it's all credit is given to God in the heavens for supporting the Protestant cause. Nobody bothered to thank Suleiman the Magnificent. And the Ottomans sparing everybody. That's, he's left out of the equation here. And then the next year, Francis Drake Black, Black actually launches two simultaneous attacks. <coughs> I'm sorry, it's actually 97 and 90, 90, 97 and 98. So it's 10 years later and 11 years later, two attacks on Spain, two English armadas. They both fail. And then Philip II, before his death, launches another armada against England. <coughs> that didn't really get off the ground. So they never give up on the idea, and then the whole thing sort of fades away. Any questions? Other things are going on in life in very old England at the time, and that leads us now to take a look at what, what Elizabeth is doing about the cultural life. She comes to power right at the height of the Renaissance coming to the So we're going to take a look at Shakespeare and Company for a few minutes. Anyway. The Armada is one thing. Overseas colonization is one thing. International stress is one thing. Well, now we're going back. One of the one of the great uh, advantages that the Renaissance had before it spread was the fact of the evolution of, of movable type in the printing press by Johannes Gutenberg. And you have a number of schools open in English in England during the Renaissance early Renaissance period. During the time starting with late the late period of Henry the Seventh. Somewhat through the period of Henry VIII, although that was a pretty tumultuous time to try to open the schools. But you had, by the time of the death of Edward VI, England is beginning to open up what's known as the English public school system. 
Uh, the English public school system is not really public. I mean, not in the sense we use it today. It's, it's private. If you could pay, you could go. But you didn't have to be noble, noble to go. You could be, you know, middle, basically middle class, part of, part of a guild. If you had the money, you could go, your parents could send you, or somebody <coughs> would patronize you or patronize you and allow you to go. Um, what is taught in these schools? <coughs> so now a little bit of a background, a small bit of a background to Shakespeare. He went to the small school, it's Trafford on Avon. Uh, has anybody been there? It's in there? Okay. It's a great little place. It's the, pretty much look, looks like it did. It looks probably better than where I went to school at that, that age. Uh, Santa Monica Boulevard School in Hollywood was a gang infested area. So anyway, even then. But uh, looking at uh, this little school, you had as your basic primer uh, the use of memorization of Greek and Latin. This is the Renaissance. If this was the Middle Ages before the rediscovery of Greek and Latin in the text, you'd be using the trivium and the quadrivium, which is a pretty limited curriculum. Um, here, you're going to study the Greek classics in the original language. You're going to have maybe five years of this under your belt. So for anybody to suggest that Shakespeare could not have known Greek and Latin, there's a real problem. This is what almost every English schoolboy that goes to school this, this time forward, right into the 19th century, is going to be exposed to, to Greek and Latin, the classics. The speeches of, of Cicero in Latin, uh, the philosophy of Aristotle in the original. And the playwrights, Aeschylus, Euripides, Sophocles, in the original. With all the, the tragedy, with all the ups and downs of the human condition being exposed here, in the Greek search for truth, so Shakespeare is, is, could very easily have been involved in these kinds of studies. And what I think more comes out of this is that he certainly, uh, pretty early in his career, uh, Receive some degree of patronage from Queen Elizabeth. Support, a support system. <coughs> He's the son of a, of a glove maker. He's definitely lower middle class, if you want to talk about class. He's everything that probably someone that's going to write like this should not be. That he could become a playwright seems almost an impossibility. But he does have support, he gets support. He's also a poet, and later becomes the owner of a theater company. Builds his own theater. It's been slightly moved, but I remember going, when I was doing research, uh, the old British Library in the office, we go across Blackfriars, Blackfriars across the Thames, and uh, the, the new globe was there. They redid re it. Some of the things I had to go see when I was there. Um, pretty impressive. Uh, he would make a good, a decent living. No question about this. Uh, but in terms of the actors, reputations, and so forth, uh, it's a very different world. Well, it's not a different world entirely. They were considered a step above beggars and whores, as they said at the time. Uh, one of the regret writers at that time, Marlowe, was involved in a major tavern brawl, and he was murdered, stabbed to death. Ben Johnson was always dueling and or fighting and if not doing either one of those, he was drunk. <laughs> uh, Shakespeare managed to stay out of, the, out, out of that fray of it. But you know, I mean, let's not make any judgments about actors, after all. Uh, 
uh, it would, you know, I, I don't want to just like talk, talking about the dead. Uh, you don't want to talk about the mother in rehab. It's not, you know, and who's not in rehab that's acting? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody here at theater major going to say, I'm going to sleep, motherfucker? <laughs> okay. But uh, they, they, it's, well, I grew up in Hollywood, okay? And I grew up with a lot of actors, child actors, a lot of stuff. I used to see them. They were in their own world all the time. They always were. Uh, you, you're friends with them or you just knew them or whatever. They were definitely in another street. And uh, the, the rest of the world and the standards did not ever affect them. They were never, they were never felt impacted by this at all, like anything. Standards, mores, morals, ethics, and the They did what they wanted to do. Um, it's just part of the name of the game. Most of the ones I grew up with are dead. We have been dead for a long time. And I won't wonder why, but I think you know why. Let's kill them off over the years. Um, the reputation at this time was that you still you had something very similar to this. Uh, these, were, these were freelance characters, uh, unpredictable, so forth. Now, that reputation may be true, may be totally false, whatever, but nonetheless. It's, at the time, though, uh, this was a, a, a budding business. Uh, and today, many find it really hard that a guy like Shakespeare could have ever written this stuff. He's unbred, he's unknown, he's unschooled. Why? He didn't go to Cambridge. Okay. That he could produce a Hamlet or a Macbeth was just beyond the pale, beyond belief that he could actually do this. And when I talk about this to my friends that teach, and largely, uh, I don't want to make a sweeping judgment here, but it's largely professors of English history, not, not, not English, English literature, that challenge Shakespeare's authorship. Historians, some do, some don't. Most don't really care. <laughs> Uh, but they don't, they don't challenge, they, okay, well, whatever, you know, whatever the evidence shows. But what we do know that he was, it, it was, his players were not, at the time, were not considered that much better than anybody else's at the time. It's only in later generations that people looking back say, you know, this stuff's pretty different. This is, this is incredible uh, insights. And they begin to take a look and see just how close they are to the Greek and Roman tragedy, especially the Greek tragedy, the classic. He knew the three big Greek playwrights inside out, and he uses their methodology a lot, yes. Uh, was it not about the time when Shakespeare wasn't writing for very well educated? Hard to say. It's really hard to say. You get a double opinion on that. Some say that he was writing, he was writing for a very elite group. Others say he's writing for a general audience. Not having been there at the time, although most people don't believe that. <laughs> I, I just, but I don't, I don't. I don't know. Are there not records of mostly that? Some of it. There are some records, but you know, again, records are what you read into it. Uh, you can get two historians looking at the same record and coming up with totally opposite conclusions. So it really it's, it becomes kind of a strange thing in terms of the research. Um, that's, I, would, I would say that you know, main, mainly he's, he's, he's running to a somewhat popular audience. At the same time, uh, it doesn't. There's no, there's no real response to it that shows up at that time. We don't have a record of what people thought in terms of being, in terms of liking it or not liking it. Which, but you know, because other playwrights were seem to be just as popular. Later, those who come along, maybe for political reasons, we're not sure look back on Shakespeare as being a real heads up above anybody else that wrote that up. Uh, a work of genius. And those that advocate that this should be a, that basically Shakespeare was written probably by a secret committee, you know, for their own reasons. Uh, Probably have never been to a committee meeting because nothing original ever shows up at a committee meeting. Ever. If you don't believe it, attend a faculty meeting. 
<laughs> and you'll see where we, wow, this school is now in trouble. <laughs> or that goes. Again, the rule by committee does not produce genes. I can see the committee for Moses, I can see the committee for uh, Shakespeare, <coughs> the committee that wrote Homer, you know. These are original geniuses in their, in their own way. That does not come by committee. It, I, you know, now it could have been another genius with a pen name showing up here, but uh, I like, you know, I like to, I like to, I like, but I like to see some evidence not just the guesswork evidence that shows up. You know, well, the nautical terms, fine. Nautical terms does not make a, does not make proof. It's not written by a sailor. Um, it's like ancient aliens that don't produce anything of a real artifact. They use evidence of ancient ruins and say, and they simply say, could these people could not have built this. This required, you know, this required a machine of some kind, an instrument of some kind. Show me the evidence. Show me the proof. Show me the proof that Shakespeare didn't do it. That somebody else, give me one piece of evidence. Give me a freaking document. There's got to be something out there somewhere that says it. Yeah. So, she said that Ellis Shakespeare No, she supported it. Patronage. She supported the Shakespeare theater to some degree because Shakespeare, uh, and here's why. <coughs> Shakespeare wrote a lot of the plays to support the, the Tudor dynasty. And the Tudor dynasty had been at risk since the time of, of Henry VII because he had, you know, he had just, they had just won the War of the Roses. The dynasty was split. Europe, by far, England is the smallest company, country in Europe. Uh, it, it, the danger of being attacked by just about anybody and everybody. So you have a dynasty at risk. <coughs> you have a dynasty who is very, very legitimacy is, is always under attack by rivals. Some rivals right on English soil, other, others in the larger for child, but rivals nonetheless, supported by rivals, supported by French kings or Spanish kings, whatever. So you have this, this, this issue of who is, Basically, who is, who, who is, why is this, this dynasty threatened? Because it has a, a, a sort of a, a very tricky, dark history that led up to the War of the Roses, and then emerging out of this comes Henry VII, the great victor. But it's at risk. It's a new dynasty. It's at risk. Will it survive? And then you have two daughters. Mary and Elizabeth. Edward VI dies and he has two daughters. Henry VIII and then two daughters and one son. The son dies early. Uh, Mary becomes the next on the line and she is a terrible ruler. She tries to kill all the Protestant subjects and they reverse everything. Uh, she dies of a uterine tumor and she's married to Philip II of Spain. This dynasty is at risk. And then comes Elizabeth and Elizabeth's on the throne, she's under attack by the Catholic Church, and so Philip II is always, always, always after, trying to support Mary, Queen of Scots, to take This dynasty needs to have, in the mind of, certainly in the mind of Elizabeth, some kind of real, I'd say, legitimate, and probably almost propagandistic support to give it Credibility in the eyes of the people. Okay, what will do that? I mean, who does that better than a playwright? It's like a guy who makes a movie. Yeah. During World War II, we had so many movies made in support of what? The war on Germany, the war on Japan. I mean, yeah. There's tons of movies, and they were all, not all of them, were, but pretty much all were propagandistic. Yeah. And I remember I grew up with them, you know? And I, once in a while I see them, I thought, God, how can we talk like that? Well, it's because you live through a war and you've got issues, big issues on your hands. But at the same time, English are looking for, I mean, not English, but the, the dynasty is looking for real support. Shakespeare 
give support to the proper members of this particular dynasty. And that he does not detract, he does not try to, because if you want, if you want to undermine a dynasty in Europe at the time, you did it through plays. In Italy, they did it through the development of opera. One of the great, one of the great operas written by Puccini, no, Puccini, I trying to think, um, Aida was a propagandistic opera uh, supporting uh, King Victor Emmanuel, Re de Italia, the king as the king of Italy. <coughs> well, he wasn't king of Italy, he was king of uh, Tuscany. And the propaganda in Italy was wanted to unify Italy under a single king to bring back the, the emergence of the Roman Empire. Try and do this in 18 and 1860. So they used opera as a method of influencing the public because they sing all these songs about the resurrection of Egypt and you're in the middle kingdom of Egypt. But everybody knew this was a, a hidden message to support the rise of the, of the, re, the, re, the, re, the reinvention of the Roman Empire with King Emmanuel as king. So you had this motto, D-E-R-D-I, where the writer was buried. It stands for D-E-R-D-I, Vittorio Emmanuel, Re di Italia. Victor Emmanuel, Re of it, King of Italy. There is no King of Italy. There's no, not even in Italy. Yeah, but we're going to make one. This is how we're doing it, using propaganda. And so when this opera was played all over Italy, everybody was standing and cheering. Yay, great cheer. We're back to the Roman Empire. Vini, Vini, Michi. It's coming back. You know, we're going to do it. And they did it. They pulled it off. They had to beat off everybody to do it. Elizabeth's having to do the same thing. So Shakespeare becomes a very integral part of the propaganda to legitimize this dynasty for good and all. The problem is, what, what is the problem? He's, he's going to do it. Shakespeare's not going to betray that trust. He's going to outdo Elizabeth by 10 years. She dies in 1603, he dies in 1613. But everything goes wrong after her death. What happens? What happens to the dynasty? It dies with her. It dies with her. She has no kid. She remains the virgin queen, but her nephew, sort of a grand great nephew, uh, James VI of Scotland becomes James I of England. He is the son of Mary Queen of Scots, whom she executed back in 1887. <coughs>